seconds. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the house and to all of and to all of you who have who are mothers uh, have that nurturing spirit and you nurtured something along and you've loved something along and you've shown compassion and kindness. Uh, happy Mother's Day to you and uh, to our online audience, to all of our moms out there. Happy Mother's Day to you. It's, I, I, I overheard Alex saying a moment ago, he didn't know I was listening in, but I can hear things in my periphery. But I overheard him saying that uh, his, he told his mother that every day was Mother's Day. Is that right? Yeah, yeah every, every day is Mother's Day. That's a, I bet that just made your mom so happy to hear that. Um, but it is that one day in the year when we get to celebrate um, our moms and the, and the role they played in both giving us life as well as nurturing us along, um, being there for us. And uh, all of us are here because of, of a mother. And we may, in, in, in some people, Mother's Day and Father's Day can be very difficult times just because of the, maybe some of the associations. We're getting feedback. Over there? Yeah. Hmm. We're getting feedback over there, Richard. I don't know if that, like a delay. Yeah. Um, What we might could do is, if you don't mind, TJ, behind those top speakers on the bottom, there's a there's a a button. Uh, You just flip it off, and it will cut those speakers off. If that helps. All right. Uh, And 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 for whatever reason we can have maybe some bad experiences, you know, and, but there always was someone in our life that had that mothering, nurturing spirit that looked out for us, that cared for us, and so there's something we can celebrate. And of course, the scriptures talk about how that, um, how that Yahweh was a mother to Israel and, and mothered Israel through the wilderness and, uh, defended her in fact in one text one of the prophets says i defended you like a she-bear and her cubs that's an image isn't it like you can you can see and those of you that know anything about bears you know that there is that kind of they have that reputation those those she-bears they they defend their cubs with everything in them so um so anyway it's mother's day so thank you all for being here today uh we've got a lot to talk about, a lot to get through. At the end of our gathering time, I'm going to update you all on 1337 Sutter Street and what's going on. I do have some updates there. Good news. Good news and just news and, and all of that. Um, so we'll get to that at the end. But before we get to that, before we get to the teaching, uh, as is our kind of posture in these moments, or, or not posture, but as is our sequence, We begin just by orienting our hearts to God, reflecting on God, slowing down from the rush of a busy week, whatever it is you had going on, the stresses and anxieties, taking a deep breath and recognizing that you're okay. You're here. God's with you. Everything's going to be all right. In the grand scheme of eternity and things, everything's going to be all right. It doesn't mean that we won't have some difficulties or challenges or whatever along the way, but God is with us in those. And right now we get to worship. We get to listen to God. We get to hear God speak and minister his spirit to our hearts. And for that, we open up just with our our attention and our direction and our focus on God. So let's do that now. Abba, Father, thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for our mothers. Thank you for bringing us into this world. Um, Thank you for your presence, that mothering 
uh, nature of the Holy Spirit that woos us, that's tender towards us, that advocates for us, that comforts us, that defends us, all of those um, feminine attributes that come from, from you. We thank you for that today, and we, we worship you. And so we just orient all of the furniture in our lives towards you. We face you with the difficulties and challenges, with the opportunities, with the blessings, with the favor, with all that's there, good and bad, beautiful and glorious. We face you with that, and we declare that this is your day you have made, uh, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. And we do this, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Woo! You can take a, take a deep breath. Uh, for those of you that are online, uh, we do have a, ha a handout today, so you can go online and grab that. Uh, it's uh, Dragonflying, what's, what's in an age. We'll be going over that in a minute. So if you want to download that, you can, uh, you can download that and uh, follow along. For those of you that are present, you can come over here to the table, grab it, grab a coloring pen if you'd like. Some people like, I like to doodle sometimes when I'm listening to a lecture. I don't know what it is but sometimes just doodling or coloring, and it makes it all kind of stick, you know? Um, in fact, they're, they're in, uh, uh, I think it was Diogenes, who was the Greek philosopher, he said that uh, one of the things that was important for learning was to eat while you learned. And so they would have table learning. They'd sit around a table and they would eat. And the idea was that as you were eating food and the words were being talked about, it would stick to the food and you would digest it. It was kind of a primitive way of thinking, of learning. And, uh, but there is something to that, you know, as you're sitting there nibbling on something or whatever. So we have some refreshments in the back. And again, for those of you that are home, just go to your cupboard, go to your refrigerator, whatever you got, uh, have, grab some coffee. And, and um, we call it kind of a worship cafe. It's a, it's a worship cafe feel. So we have... Uh, we we were taking a like look at the dragonfly as a metaphor for the two halves of life, and uh, today we're going to be looking at a scripture where Jesus talks about the two halves of life. Um, but the dragonfly, as we pointed out uh, two weeks ago, the dragonfly has an underwater life most the vast majority of its life, and some species up to ninety percent of its existence is underwater. And then it has an out-of-water life, which involves, you know, a molting season where it sheds its skin between the species. It can be anywhere from six molting, uh, um, shedding layers, all the way up to 14 layers of, of shedding. It just depends on the species. But once it sheds that final layer, then it spends the rest of its life in flight. And it's a wonderful way of reflecting on sometimes many of us have experienced maybe in the first season, the first half of life, we've experienced disappointments, setbacks. We may have been victims. We may have um, uh, acted out in ways that, have, that we regret. And as we look at that, sometimes there's voices that we hear that say, you are a failure. And because you have done this in the first half of life, it is indicative of your whole life. Your life is a waste. Your life has no value. Your life has no worth. So just, you know, exist. Breathe in air. Breathe out air. That's all you have. And yet when we look at one of God's creatures, it tells us, it speaks to us of something, we, of a good news. That just because the first half of your life or a big portion of your life was spent underwater, in unfulfillment does not is not indicative does not mean that your whole life is meant to be that and we can look to both the butterfly and the dragonfly as examples of those that begin one thing but they end in a glorious other and so it gives us the same kind of hope we can look at jesus as an example of this as well we see the, the, his death, the brutal loss of life at such a young age with so much promise, with so much, and yet his life snuffed out, taken from him just like that at the height, at the peak of his, what you might call career, his teaching career, 
and his um, uh, 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 justice, social justice impact on the world taken away from him senselessly. And we think, what a waste, what a loss. His disciples felt that way anyway. Only to realize that the second half, what happened after the resurrection, the second body of Christ, of which we are, was something far more glorious. It has flown from the first century all the way to the 21st century. It's flown from the little regions of the Galilee all the way to America and to the Orient and to the Pacific Isles and to Latin America. It's flown all over the world and Christ's body is experienced and seen and felt from one culture to another culture, from one ethnic background to another, from, from one socioeconomic background to another. It, it has flown the coop. Nothing can contain it. It cannot be contained in any one box. And it's beautiful. And so we see, even in Christ, that dragonfly nature, that butterfly nature, that what it was in one body, limited to one space in time, one region in the world, could not contain it. And here we are today as a result of that message, that beautiful, glorious message that has saved all of us and brought us here today. So, the dragonfly we're using as that metaphor. Now, uh, today I think I'm, I'm one, of the, one of the, I guess, headings of what we'll walk through is just the, the mythology of the Maltings. When we say use the word mythology, we're talking about um, myths or mythologies uh, are something that declare a truth. It doesn't mean that it is factually, literally true that we are all dragonflies, <laughs> but it declares a truth to us, right? And we want to reflect on the Maltings. How do we go from, under, from this kind of under the water world into this into the air world and there's that what we might call what psychologists refer to as a liminal that's the word they use an in between like it's an in between space it's that space between under the water and into the air something happens it's that what um uh, scientists refer to as the black box like the butterfly goes into the the chrysalis and something happens in that black box and you know it's baffled it baffled scientists and biologists for years what happened in there and we still have so there's so many mysteries about it about that the golden goo as they refer to kind of that liquefying effect that happens to the caterpillar and then the restructuring of a butterfly so it's that that black box something happens in that in between and we play a role in it and then nature God's nature plays a role in that as well. And it's that role, that design of the Holy Spirit at work in our life, which, has been re which we refer to in John chapter 3 as the new birth, and gets spoken of, I think, no less than 16 or 17 times in the epistles, referring to you've been you know, born, uh, born from above or you know, a, a new birth has happened to you or this newness of life. Um, we've risen to walk a brand new life. This whole idea of something new happening gives all of us hope and anticipation that there is something coming forth from the brokenness. And Paul says in Romans that the earth is groaning, travailing in birth pain as it brings forth the redemption of the children of God. We are that offspring. We have, these are, this is language that gets used over and over, we have an inheritance. We have something new that is, that is coming forth from within us. In fact, Paul says in another place, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he, she is a New creation. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become brand new. So what is this passing away of the old and the entering into the new? Well, again, this metaphor of molting. And I would like to just draw your attention um, to where Jesus talks about the two halves of life, and then where he references 
uh, what I would like to say is like, how do you live in the liminal? How do you function, act, behave when you're in the in-between? Because a lot of us are in the in-between, right? And so, and by the way, just in case you think you're not in the in-between, I was reading an article uh, this, this week uh, from, a, from a psychologist that, that they did a research project on uh, transitions and how frequently change happens. And uh, this, this uh, uh, study said that every 18 months, we go through some kind of a molting. And it can be, and he cited all these different wor- places that it happens. It can be a pandemic. Like it can be things external to you that you have no control over. It can be just the shifting of age, like you're going from this season of life to this season. It can be a job change. It can be the loss or the death of someone that's very close to you. It can be like there's all of these moments where transition is happening, a graduation, you know, getting, getting your driver's license, getting, your, getting uh, your first job, getting your second job, the loss of a job. You know, there's all, like every 18 months is the frequency of which transition is happening. He goes on to say that those are the opportunities when we are very much in a, in a shifting space. We might be moving from this lo- physically, from this neighborhood to this neighborhood, or this state to this state, or this. Lo- and those are moments of incredible uh, um, tension and stress and anxiety and, and heightened alertness, right? Because there's changes that are that are happening. So, in John chapter 21, um, there is this. This beautiful picture. Are we still echoing a little? Yes. It might. That one might need to be turned off as well. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank you, TJ. Um, <clears throat> it's my fault. I turned them on today because I was going to have music playing. But, folks, I'm not tech savvy. I just try. I just uh, thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. So. This is an interesting story, and it, it really, it's like, it's a case study in Peter going from kind of this underworld existence, transitioning into an, 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 um, a liminal space, into a flight into the air existence. And so, to give you a little bit of the backstory of what's happened here, Peter um, considered himself early on in his life a very I guess you could say he was like a cussing sailor. He was a fisherman. He had the reputation of being, you know, rambunctious, being kind of uh, uncouth maybe, like just raw. Early on, he meets Jesus in Jesus' ministry. Jesus calls him from that into being one of his disciples, one of his followers. Tells him, you've been fishing for fish, I'm going to make you a fisher of people. And, and Peter follows. And, uh, and he becomes this spokesperson for all the, for the 12. Like he's loud. He's like, let's do it. He's kind of like that guy that's just like ready to charge, you know, just charge anything. Just take it on, right? Always ready to go. It gets him into trouble frequently. Um, and uh, at the very end of Jesus' ministry, Jesus says uh, at his last supper, they don't know it's the Last Supper, of course. They're just having a, a, a religious meal together. And Jesus says, you know, I'm, I'm going to be uh, crucified and taken into custody and, you know, da 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 And Peter says, and, and then Jesus says, and, and you all will flee and run and betray me. And Peter is like, no, all these guys will, but not me. I can see all of them running, but I'm right, I've got your back. I'm your ride or die. I'm with you till the end. And Jesus looks at Peter and he says, actually, tonight, you're going to deny me three times. And it happens. Jesus is taken into custody. Peter finds himself following from a distance. And then someone says to him, he's, there's a coal fire. He's got his hands being warmed by the fire. He's waiting to see what happens with Jesus. And someone says to him, you sound like a Galilean. You're one of his followers. And he utters profanity. He curses. He gets angry. He denies. I don't even know that man. I don't even know what you're talking about. No way. I would never be associated with someone like that. Someone else walks up to the fire. This happens three times. And then he hears a rooster crow, and he realizes, as Jesus said, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. And he realizes Jesus knows. 
And the scripture says that he went out and he wept bitterly. Like he had such, he had higher expectations of himself. He thought he was already flying. He thought he, was alre- he had already reached his destiny. That he already was in the place that he, was, that he had envisioned himself being. Only to discover that he was not. Like what he thought about himself wasn't true. He was a betrayer. He was a denier. And, um, and so we pick up this story where it says in John 20 that he says to his other friends that are fishermen, he goes, I'm going to go back to fishing. And so he goes back out to go fishing after this whole episode of him denying Christ. There's like reports that Jesus has appeared to the disciples. There's reports. Um, and he, if we can, if we, from what we gather in chapter 20, he even has a, a moment where he experiences a resurrection of Jesus. But it's one of those things where, what do you do? Like, you have literally followed someone, and now all of a sudden, they're kind of appearing and disappearing. And you're like, I, how do you follow that act? What do you, you know, where do you sign up for that? So you don't know what to do. He doesn't know what to do. So he's like, I'm just going to go back to fishing. I'm, and so he does. He goes back to fishing. And then we have this beautiful story in the beginning of John 21 where Jesus um, appears on the shore. And as they're fishing, they haven't caught anything. And he tells them, you know, throw your net on the side. They throw their net on the side. They catch all of these fish. They come in. Jesus has breakfast going for them on the, on the shore. It's just a beautiful, beautiful moment. And uh, then Jesus walks through a process of what I'm going to call a liminal space of how does he get Peter from, from that place where he is molted and died to what he thought he was. Like, he thought he was his best version. He thought he was in his destiny. And then he goes through this season, he go, and Jesus brings him through to the place where eventually you know him, as we'll read in Acts chapter 2, of him being the voice, of him being that bold voice, of him arriving in the place that he was destined to really be, but he couldn't see it. So, in John chapter 21, Jesus, uh, let's read through this, since it's such a... Um, so it's, it's such a beautiful um, uh, story that gets told uh, as we consider the three denials of Peter. In verse chapter 21, verse 15, they've had breakfast, and uh, they've been hanging out with Jesus there. And in verse 15, it says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, first half of life, when you were younger, you dressed yourself, You went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Second half of life. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Now, much has been made of this text here because there, in, in the Greek, there's a couple of different words that are being used for love. You have um, Jesus saying, you know, do you have uh, phileo love for me? And Peter, go, Peter saying, I have agape love for you. Jesus saying, do you really have, do you have phileo love for me? Peter going, I have agape love for you. Finally, G, finally Peter comes around and says, I have phileo love for you. There's been a lot of discussion on that that gets lost in English. And I think sometimes we can just, it, it, it kind of becomes a big distract, distract, it can become a big distraction as to like what does it really mean. But I'd like to point out, I think, three things that are important 
for us to take when we're, when we're considering being in a liminal space. We're not what we were, and we're not what we're destined to be, and we're kind of in this in-between, right? And so why doesn't Jesus say to Peter, I forgive you, and I love you? Like, we would think that that's what he needs to be healed, right? Like, Peter is the one that has offended Jesus. He's the one that has betrayed. And to hear Jesus say to him, I love you and I forgive you, we think that that's what he needs to be healed. In fact, when we first come to God, when we see Nicodemus first come to Jesus, Jesus declares to Nicodemus at the very beginning, when Nicodemus says, how can one be born again? Jesus says, well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. God did not send his son in the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. We see that love, God's love for the world, and one's faith in that love is the activating point of a new birth, right? That's where it's activated. God's love, my response in faith, boom, something happens to that. Something happens within that. But here there's something else going on. Jesus isn't saying, do you believe that I love you and I have forgiven you? Jesus is asking him, do you love me? Now, why? Why does Jesus say, do you love me? And I think there's three reasons, like when we walk through this, I think there's, there's three reasons for what's going on here that we can benefit and learn from. When you're in an in-between space, there's a certain way, certain confessions to make, a certain posture to have, and, a, and, and, and certain steps to take. A confession, a posture, and steps. The confession is, frequently we need to hear ourselves. Say, I love you. Why? Because all the self-doubt that Peter was probably going through after he had denied Christ was in his head. He was saying, I really don't love him. I really didn't love him. If I would have loved him, I wouldn't have failed. If I would have loved him, I wouldn't have denied him. My, my great uncle was a pastor in San Diego, and uh, I remember him telling this story. He had a German Shepherd dog, and uh, the German Shepherd, <clears throat> he said, that dog was my best friend. That dog loved me with everything in him. I mean, it was like, you know how pets are, right? I mean, pets can just be like the most beautiful, wonderful things, right? He said, this dog was that, and he said, I came home one day, and he had got into the trash, and it was all over. It was everywhere, and he was standing, he was sitting there, with his tail wagging, tongue out, like, look what I did. And he said, I told him, no, no, no. I picked up all the trash, I put it back in, I scolded him, and figured that would be enough. The next day, he got into it again, out there on the porch, tail wagging, was so excited. Look, what I, look, look at my creation, my art. It is all over the yard, trash everywhere. And he said, you know, I never doubted his love. I just knew that his instincts and his nature was a certain way that he needed training. But I never doubted that this dog was loyal. I didn't say, if you love me, you would not have gone into the trash. Be gone with you, dog. I didn't do that. He said, in fact, I love the dog. I, I just knew that this was part of his nature and it's gonna take some training and eventually he'll learn. It's similar with us. Just because we may do things, act in certain ways or whatever, it doesn't mean that we don't love God. It means that we're in a process of being discipled. We're in a process of learning and growing. And we'll get there eventually by God's grace and through the power of the Holy Spirit. We will. Being patient with ourselves. So for me to be able to hear myself say, you know, Lord, I love you. I'm sorry. I'm grieving what happened. I feel unworthy. But that is not a question regarding my love. I love you. 
And I love how Peter ends those three, those three movements. He gets to the end. He goes, look, you know all things. You know everything. You know I love you. That confession is a powerful confession. The first confession we need to have is just that God loves me. We start with that, right? We start with going, God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. Whew, I am so loved by God. Woo-hoo-hoo! I am so loved by God. We start with that, and we're like clicking our heels and dancing, and we're just like, life is so great. Life is so wonderful. I am loved by God. I am loved by God. And then we blow it. We do something. We're ang- we get angry with ourselves because we acted out in anger. We said something we shouldn't have said. We did something we shouldn't have done, and we feel, we feel remorse and regret over that. And, and then we're just like, then we're thinking, God doesn't love me. God, because we're so used to transactional relationships. God doesn't love me. God doesn't love me. And I must not really have loved God. That must have been a fluke. I'm not sure what happened. It was good while it lasted. And coming back to that place of going in the midst of feeling, in, in the middle of feeling, why did I do that? What was wrong? In the middle of that going, I love you. I still love you. I love that confession is powerful. And that's what Jesus is eliciting from Peter. He's like, just say it. And they go, say it again. Say it again. I know you love me. You need to hear yourself say it. It's not about me. I know it. But you don't know it. You're doubting it. So say it. That's where we start. Right where you're seated. Right wherever you're at online. You just start by whispering it. I love you. I love you. I love you. You say it again and again and again. I stumble. I falter. I'm not perfect. I love you. I love you. We're going to get there, Lord. I'm shedding some layers. I'm molting. I'm working through some things here. But I love you. I love you. I love you. Look, you would not be in this room right now. Not a one of you would be in this room right now. There's a billion things to do in San Francisco. You would not be here on a Sunday morning. You would be taking it easy on a Sunday morning like the beautiful gospel song says. I'm easy like a Sunday morning. Oh. You'd be taking it easy somewhere. You are here because there's something in your heart that loves God. You're watching online because there's something in you that loves God. We don't get any special accolades for being here. You don't walk in and I hand you a hundred bucks. You're not here for any ulterior motives. There is something inside of you that loves God. And confessing that is powerful. You know I love you. You know I love you. You know I love you. The second thing is a, is that we see is a posture. Jesus says to him, um, feed my sheep. Feed my Care for my lambs. Feed my sheep. Care for my sheep. Here's the second thing you need to know. And it's a posture you have in your heart. You are needed by God. God has a purpose for you. And sometimes you have to just hear it. Hear God saying, feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. Hear God speaking to you. I've got, yeah, but I just denied you three times. Feed my sheep. You mean I'm worthy to take care of your sheep even though I denied you three times with utter profanity? I I disavowed you. I disowned you. I cursed you. Feed my sheep. I still need you. You're valuable to me. And some of you are here and you're thinking, man, I don't know what my purpose is. I don't know. You know, we've got, we go through all these things in our head. God has a purpose you're called to step into and feel. And it can be as simple as loving your next door neighbor, sharing a meal with someone, spending time, precious time. You know what the biggest struggle is? I've heard, I've heard Kim Skavota say this so many times about Mother Teresa saying this. There's more studies coming out since the pandemic. In America right now, loneliness is the biggest psychological struggle in our country. 
And it's not just with a certain age group. There was a report that came out like two or three weeks ago about how youth are struggling with loneliness in unprecedented numbers. It's this. Like they have got so far removed from human interaction that now it's affecting them psychologically. There's more suicide attempts. I mean, it, 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 it's everywhere. Loneliness. And, and then you get to a city like this that doesn't have multi-generations. It's not multi-generations thick. You talk about loneliness, it's everywhere. And you think God doesn't want to use you? Sitting down, having coffee with someone, hearing their story, caring, praying for someone. There's no limit to how God wants to use you. And some of us are over here thinking, well, I need to have a perfect track record. That's BS. I'm just going to call it for what it is, brothers and sisters. It's BS. Someone, someone was saying to me a while back, they're like, why is it in the Bible God uses all of these people that are so imperfect? You know, you got Abraham pimping his wife. You got Moses that's a murderer. You've got, you've got, you've got Saul of Tarsus that's a murderer. You've got like some serious people that, and the other guy was, we're sitting in a conversation, he goes, well, who else does he have to use? Like all he has are people that are broken. They're humans. They're sinners. Right? Allow yourself to be used. God smiling through you. God's presence in you. I am so convinced. God's spirit in you. Just You could walk out on the corner of Van Ness and Sutter. You could stand on that corner, just God's presence in you, not say a word, not empty your pockets out and give to everyone. You could just stand there, and God's presence in you makes a difference on that corner. Now, can you imagine what happens when you add a few words to it, and you put a smile on it? You show some compassion and some love. Could you imagine what would happen if you, every day, every day, you woke up and God's like, look, it, you got your whole day to do what you want. Would you just give me one task? Like, let me give you one task each day. Small task. You got your to-do to -do list, right? You got your 15 things you're going to do that day. But then right there at the bottom, you can maybe move it up a little too to the top, you put in there God task. And it could be something like call so-and-so. And encourage them. It could be something like give. It could be something like volunteer with an organization that's doing good in the city. Just do my part. Whatever it is, one task, each, just one task. What would happen? Because here's what Jesus keeps saying to Peter feed my sheep. Tend to my lambs. I've got a purpose. I want to use you. I want to love through you. I want to care through you. That posture of use me, speak through me, love through me. As Paul says in one point, he says, it's not I, but Christ in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I am just being animated by the very presence of Jesus Christ. I can take no glory for it. I'm just in flow. I'm with God. That's the second. The posture. The third. The third. Jesus says to Peter after it's, do you love me? And then after feed my sheep, he says, follow me. And here's where we can get kind of tripped up. Now, we're talking about being in that liminal space. When you're in the liminal space, confess, I love God. From that posture that you know he loves you. All right? Secondly, in that liminal space, hear God call you to do a work for him, to be involved with him. Hear that. Third, follow me. And here's where we can get a little off kilter. Scripture says that Peter 
Jesus says, follow me to Peter, and then he turns around and he starts walking away. And Peter turns around and he sees the disciple whom Jesus loved following. And he's like, oh, wait, hold up, hold up. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. He says, Lord, all right, I hear you. Okay, so when I was younger, I was in full control. When I'm older, I'm no longer in full control. When I was younger, I was strong. When I'm older, I'm weak. All right, I'm tracking. When I was younger, I did whatever I want. I dressed myself. When I'm older, I'm not, I'm going to be stripped of all of that. By the way, this is a, this is imagery. This is a crucifixional imagery. Because what they would do when someone was being crucified is they would strip them and then they would put the bar to their arms, tie them up, and they would lead them out. So this is all the language here. You'll be stripped, you'll be tied, you'll be led out to a place you're not wanting to go. When you were younger, you just did whatever you wanted, foot loose, fancy free. That won't be the case when you're older. Okay. So Peter's like, all right, so I see how this is going down for me. What about him? <laughs> right, this is what we tend to do. Like when we're in a liminal space, if we're not careful, we get our eyes off of Jesus. And we're looking at other people, other groups. Like, what about their Christianity? You know, what about what they're doing? Are they right or are they wrong? Like, what? And we get caught up in this, this game of comparisons. Uh, there was a, a study done on, on, on comparisons. This kind of is a sociological study done on comparisons. And the anxiety and the stress that, that the human uh, psyche goes through when it starts comparing is unbelievable. Like it's one of, the, one of the worst things you can do is start comparing yourself with others because it leads usually to judgment. It leads to fault finding, excuse making, all of that stuff. And this is what Peter does. Like, he's in that moment. He's just been told, feed my sheep. He's just been told, he's believing that he loves God. Now all of a sudden he's back to where he was before. Okay, now, what about him? And Jesus beautifully just says, if I want him, this has got to be a dagger for Peter too. I mean, consider it. If I want him to remain alive until I return, what's that to you? I just told you you're going to die a martyr's death. <laughs> this guy may not die a martyr's death. He might actually be around when I return. If I say that that's how it's going to go down, what's that to you? Just follow me. This scripture has given me so much peace in my life as it relates to other Christians, other believers, pe people that may view God differently than I view God. They may be more liberal, more conservative, more whatever you want to call it. This scripture is just, it's been my mantra. It's what's held me fast. It's like, I, I am not their master. I am not their Christ. I have, it's not my blood that saves them. Who am I to stand on the sideline and go, what about that person, Lord? What about this person over here? Well, why do I want to get into this judging game of saying who's in, who's out, who's good, who's bad? Who am I to do that? Just follow Jesus, Jeff. Just follow him. That's it. Someone was telling me the other day, they were just like, you know, I don't, I don't, how are they saying? I don't, they're going through all the things they don't believe and all the things they do believe. And, and I, I sensed, I didn't know, but I just sensed, are they trying to get a rise out of me? Like, are they thinking that this is going to like set me off? Because it was all the things like typically that, you know, like I, you would think that a pastor would be, or, or against, or, you know, like, you know, organized, organized Christianity, or a church building, and gathering in a church building, and like all these kind of things, you know, I'm, and was insinuating that I'm, that they have the truth, and anyway, and just was like going, 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 and I just was like, I finally I just said, look, I just, I just want to say this, I have no agenda in my relationship with you but to love you. I'm not trying to get you into my building. And I'm not trying to save you or something. I just want to love you. That's it. 
And I trust that you are following Christ the way he's calling you to follow him. And I'm just, that's between you and him. Meanwhile, I'm over here following as best as I know how. But let's just love each other. Immediately, the tension went out of the room. It was like we were best buddies. I knew there was something about you that I liked. I was like, okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then it was like, you know, I see, this is exact words, I see in you all the good that I just never am. I was like, what? It's like, I'm just a mean person. That's what this person's saying to me. I'm a mean person, and you know, I, I enjoy telling people about Jesus. But then after I tell them, and they seem to come to Jesus, then they get offended at me all the time. I just offend people. I think what, I, what God's telling me in this is that I need to connect those people that I bring to Jesus to you. <laughs> I was like, that's fine. Whatever, whatever Christ, if that's what Christ is calling you to do, just follow him. Just follow him. So there is this, like, this moment, right, in all of us, when we're in this process of this liminal space, when all of a sudden we get our eyes off of somebody else's molting process, what they're doing, where they're at, and we look up and we see the air. We see the world that we're called to inhabit and live in, the kingdom that we're called to give voice to, and we go for it. And we step into the best moments and seasons of our life. In as you're going through this this week, you know I cite a couple of studies in here, and then and then there there's some. Um, Lectio Divina, um, things to process through. I want to say a word about this. One of the Lectio Divinas is on 1 Corinthians, where Paul talks about when I'm weak, then I am strong. Um, I'm up here, my brain's already starting to kind of like forget. Oxytocin? Oxytocin. I always get it confused with Oxycontin. They're very different, trust me, very different. Um, oxytocin is considered to be the, the love uh, uh, hormone, um, and it is something that is inside of us, and it is a compassion hormone that's at work in us. Studies have come out in the past like couple months um, on this. Uh, there's been a lot of studies done on this. That this hormone, as you age, become stronger and stronger. There's a release of more of it in your body as you get older. Yeah, it's true. In fact, they say that people that are, that people when they're younger, you know, volunteer or have some kind of uh, generosity, even little, that as they get older, it increases. So that when you're older, and they say it is directly linked to the sense and the feeling of fulfillment and satisfaction. And if a person doesn't have that, that's the hormone that is communicating being fulfilled with one's life, satisfied. If a person doesn't have that in their life, they feel unsatisfied, unfulfilled. There's a lack of compassion and generosity. Now, what's interesting about this is in the first half of life, we're dependent upon our strength. We're dependent upon our abilities, our talents. We have what's referred to as fluid intelligence. This is the ability to amass all kinds of facts. Did you know that like the, the peak of, of one's career is about 20 is about 20 years after one starts their career, you peak. All the innovation, everything that happens. So most uh, Nobel, Nobel Prize winners are in their early 30s. Rarely, rarely, rarely do you see a Nobel Prize winner in their 50s and 60s. Just doesn't happen. Because it's dependent upon a certain kind of intelligence. It's dependent upon fluid intelligence. But somewhere about halfway through life, as your fluid intelligence begins to go down, Harvard researchers talk about there's another intelligence that starts going up, and it never hits a bell curve. It keeps going up, 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 up until the day you die. It's called crystallized intelligence. And it's why some people, as, they, it's why, as people age, they usually become more articulate, they usually, they, they actually can do better with languages, although they, they might not be able to pronounce the words as well. They have a better 
grasp at understanding languages as you get older. There are certain things that when you get older, you just do better. You actually are able to synthesize information in the second half with, with all that you've learned. And what happens, basically, they're saying is the stuff that just doesn't matter, it kind of sinks to the bottom, and the stuff that's really important, it begins to surface. And you're able to connect the dots. And you're able to have a bigger picture view of life that young, younger people just don't have. And this happens all the way until you die. It's why they say wisdom is what happens when we get older. Now, to be sure, there are exceptions to these rules. That's why there's the term, you know, old fool. Or a wise soul. My son's like a wise soul. He's an old soul. Old soul, I'm sorry. He's just... It's, I mean, it's uncanny. For some reason, he's got this gift of just understanding what really matters and what doesn't. And I've seen him make decisions that make me super, super proud, but I just, I don't have, I, I can't take much credit for it. He's just an old soul. Like, there's people that are like that. They're accepting that. Then you have people um, that are, you have a youthful spirit when they're older. I'm talking about Joshua. And Caleb, right? That when they're 80, they're doing things that the 40-year-old guys are doing. Right? They have a youthful spirit. So it's possible to have that youthful spirit and it, even to grow in you as you get, as you get older. My, I think my, my grandma was just so playful. You know, she got older, just was playful and, and took things lightly. You know, wasn't, didn't, just things just kind of brushed off. It was easy with me. So you can have, all of that can be something that you have. But you're going to, but we have to like de- have the intention of developing ourselves with where the Spirit of God is leading us, to go with it, to flow with it, and to realize there's some things that just aren't important. And there are some things that are very much important. I think where all of that kind of comes together is when we recognize, as Paul says, when I am weak, he is strong. And when you can embrace your weaknesses and the vulnerability that goes along with those weaknesses, can be vulnerable with those weaknesses, you begin, wisdom begins to manifest itself in your life. Like when you can be real with, because so much of youth is just propped up ego and, and that strength is nothing but a sham. Hiding other things that are really, really dysfunctional and broken inside. But when you can be real and vulnerable, then in your weakness, you're strong. Because Christ is at work in the weakness. Last, last Sunday, you heard me sharing and talking about the, um, uh, the vision of the table and, um, and how in this vision that I had of all these broken people sitting around a table and that when they sat down and, and there were, there were um, uh, a couple of people that in the vision I knew. Like, I knew these people, and most of them I didn't know, but there were a couple that I knew. And, um, and I remember, like, one of the, it, the moment of that vision, what was so, viv- uh, um, that stood out to me, was as the people were getting this, gathering around to sit down, there was, like, a lot of sadness and sorrow, a lot of disappointment and regret, like, as, as that but then the moment they were seated and plugged in, it was like a light came on and they were laughing and talking and just carrying on and there was just a sense of communal joy. Like it's okay. And it was beautiful. It was just beautiful. And I think this is really what Christ, one, of the, one of the salient features of Christ in his church is this power and agenda of Christ to pull in all of us that are maimed, broken, aching, wounded, herded. Pull us in around this table. Plug us in together and then animate us with his spirit. Fill us with joy. Communal joy. 
was talking to a pastor this week about um, just catching up on our on our on our situation with our building and he's planting a church in in dc a friend of mine is planting a church in washington dc and he said at this stage he's just been going out and talking with people and he said i was talking with someone the other day and this person said to me something he said i just could not get away from and obviously i couldn't either because it really stuck with me this person said you know there's a lot of church plants that go on around here. And he said, I'm just not interested in a bunch of programming. I'm not interested in a Sunday show. Like I just, I, I just have no interest in any of that stuff. He said, I'll tell you what I want. I just want to be in a community where people love each other. I don't care about the Sunday show. I don't care about who's singing, what they're singing. I just don't, I don't care anymore. I just want to be where people love each other. And he said, and the second thing is, I don't really care about, he says to my friend, I don't really care about how smart you are, how much you know. It's great, but I don't, I, I just want to be a, whew. when my friend said this to me, it just hit me. I was just like, oh God. Oh, Lord, right here. He said, I just want to be in a place where Jacob's ladder comes down. And I was like, I want that. I can feel that. I want that. I want to be in a place where Jacob's ladder comes down. You know, that's language for I want to be in a place where God's presence is. I just want to be in God's presence. That's, I, I was like, Justin, bro. As one of my other pastor friends says, I said, I'm ganking that for me. I'm taking that. I'm claiming that. I don't know who this guy is. If I need to copyright it, I'll copyright it. But I just, I just want to be in a place where Jacob's ladder comes down. And I want to be in a place where people love each other. That's what I want. And I think that's what most people want. That's what you want. That's what we want. And that's what we get. Um, we're going to have a time of worship. Johnny's going to come lead us in, in some worship here. Um, I'm going to say a word of prayer before we do that. But um, uh, when we're done, I'm going to go over some of the, when we're done worshiping, I'm going to go over, so don't run off just yet, I'm going to go over uh, some of the opportunities that we have and what's going on with the building. There's been like some major developments this week. So I just want to catch you all up on that because I know you're all very interested. You know, that's why you're that's why you're here. Johnny, do you need me to? Yeah. Cool. How's everybody doing? Great. Yeah? Much better. Much better? Fired up? Let's, uh, let me say a word of prayer. Um, as I'm praying, well, let's start off with this. I'm going to start off with a confession. Say this with me. Lord, Lord you, know, you know I love you. I love you. Let's say it one more time. Lord, Lord you, know, you know I love you. We're just joining in with Peter right here today. Lord, you know, you know all things. All things. You, know, you know I love you. Father, thank you so much for the love that you have bestowed upon us and calling us your children and calling us your own. The healing that comes from that is, is more like a resuscitation. It's more like coming to life. And then along the way, we make some mistakes. We stumble along. We find ourselves in these liminal spaces. And today, we are just confessing, you know we love you. And here we are in that love, your love for us and our love for you, being restored to a purpose in your kingdom, being called to follow you and kind of get our eyes off of other people, and to live out this glorious calling that we see in the, in the dragonfly of, of just flying into places that we were born for, birthed for, and destined to. And we offer our hearts, 